This is our third part of the lecture looking at symbioses. So now we're moving into uh, relationships that are less clear cut. The ones that we looked at before were primarily mutualistic for the components that we were looking at. There was definitely parasitisms and commensalisms involved within those, but for the most part, mutualisms across the board. Here we're going to start looking at mutualisms that are more parasite-like or have more parasitic components. Um, and then we'll look at some just straight parasitisms. Um, I didn't include any commensalisms in here. The most commonly referenced commensalism is one where there is a sea cucumber that has a fish that lives inside of its butt. Doesn't sound like a commensalism, but I encourage you to look it up because it's very fun. Um, probably not for the sea cucumber. Okay, so ants and acacias. Here we can see a species of ant that I don't remember what species it is. I think it's actually multiple species that do this. It is because you want multiple species as an acacia on you um, for kind of the best uh, survival. More on that later if you talk to me in person. So acacias are these large trees um, that are growing in tropical to subtropical areas um, and they have a lot of competition with other plants. So ants are living on these acacias and providing them many services and the acacia provides many services in return. The ants will protect the leaves, so anytime any other organism gets on this tree, ants will go attack it. If a giraffe comes over and nibbles on these tree leaves, the ants will go bite that giraffe all over its face. If a spider comes and tries to make a home on these leaves and make a nest out of it, those ants will en masse go attack that spider, right? So they are attacking anything that is causing any threat to this tree. If you go sit at the base of one of these trees and fall asleep, ants will probably come attack you. The other thing that they do for the acacia is that they'll mow down any vegetation on the ground around the tree. So they eliminate any immediate source of competition. This is providing great benefit to the acacias where herbivory and competition are huge selective pressures. So what do the ants get in return? The acacia will produce these large hollow thorns, and that's what you're seeing over here, is an ant popping out of one of these large hollow thorns. And then inside that hollow thorn is where the ants will produce their larvae. So they lay their eggs in there and they develop into larvae and they feed them inside these nice protected structures. What do they feed them? They feed them these protein and lipid rich packets that are produced at the ends of each of the acacia needles. This is a huge expenditure for the tree. It's like producing a little sack lunch at the end of each of its needles, of which it has many. So that is a um, high value food source. The other high value food source that they're giving to the ants, you can see this ant drinking from right now. There's this little like rounded structure. This is called a nectary. And there's a hole in the middle and this nectary is going to give basically a well-like source to the phloem tissue so it, there's going to be nectar which is this sugary fluid produced inside these nectaries that the ants can then access they don't have direct access to the phloem tissue i shouldn't say that but it's a it's a wellspring of sugary fluid for them to drink so they get their carbohydrates here and they get their fats and um proteins from um, these little uh, lunch packets. I'm not sure if they're still called eliosomes when they're produced on the ends of the needles, but very similar. So this all sounds very straightforward mutualism. The only real element of parasitism here is that once an ant drinks from one of these nectaries, there's some kind of compound, and I'm hopefully I don't communicate this incorrectly. There's some kind of compound within the nectar that prevents the ants from being able to metabolize other types of sugars. So once you have drunk from the acacia tree, that is now the only food source you can have. But happy life up there, protecting your domain and having all of the food and housing that you need. Weird, complicated mutualism. Lichens are another example of a weird, complicated mutualism. Here we're looking at um, a long section through a lichen, and you'll remember that a lichen is a combination between a fungus or multiple fungi, 
and algae, cyanobacteria, or both. So there's some fungal partner or partners, and then there's some photosynthetic partner or partners. So the complicated thing about a lichen is that the fungus is entirely dependent on its photobiont. The fungus is never going to be found outside of the lichen relationship. However, the algae or cyanobacteria are, they are free living in the environment. Now they're not free living in every environment where that particular lichen might be found. So these algae and cyanobacteria could survive on their own, but not in all of the environments that the lichen can then survive. So their ability to survive and reproduce is increased by their um, association in this lichen relationship. However, the fungi are controlling everything about what happens to the algae or cyanobacteria. I'm not sure how intricate their relationship with the cyanobacteria are. Uh, mostly we studied um, the algal relationship. So here on the right, you can see these algal cells that are surrounded by fungal hyphae. And the hyphae penetrate into the algal cells. And what they do is they instantly take any of the sugars that the algae make um, from photosynthesis and they convert it into a sugar substance, I think into mannitol, which is a sugar that the algae can't use, but the fungus can. So any sugars that the algae makes, the fungus takes and then converts into something that the algae can't then take back. So it's sort of like the fungus is farming the algae and um, harvesting their, their food sources. So the algae only really gets to eat when the lichen thallus starts to dry out and the fungus is sort of distracted and is repairing the rest of the thallus. And this is a little bit maybe anthropomorphized. Um, but as far as I understand it, that's how it works. So the lichen is sort of a mutualism in that the algae um, can survive and reproduce in areas or more a broader variety of areas. But when it gets to eat and its reproduction is all controlled by the fungus. So if you would consider corn as having a mutualism with people because we um, transplanted out into a bunch of different areas um, where it wouldn't normally grow and we care for it and we make sure it survives and we ensure its reproduction. If we have a mutualism with corn, then sure, fungi have this mutualism with algae and that's a lichen. We have learned about mycorrhizal fungi in a um, mutualistic context. However, as with any sort of mutualism or um, system where everybody's going to benefit, there's going to be somebody in there who's a cheater. And orchids have evolved to be sort of partial cheaters. So orchids, if you think about vanilla ice cream or vanilla bean ice cream, where it has those little black flecks in it, those are the seeds of vanilla pods, right? So if you scrape out the seeds of a vanilla pod, they're tiny. There's like no nutrients stored within those seeds. The orchid strategy is to produce thousands of tiny seeds and give them very little to survive on. Vanilla is a type of orchid. So how do they survive? What they do is they form a relationship, a symbiosis with mycorrhizal fungi, and they sort of lure the fungus in or kind of signal to it chemically that it is there to be a plant to associate with. And then the fungal hyphae penetrate the cells, thinking that they're gonna have this exchange relationship, and then instead get kind of pulled in to the orchid cells, and the orchid cells start to lice, break apart the fungal hyphae, and take nutrients from them. And they do this until they have enough nutrients to have made their first leaves and start to photosynthesize. So they are heterotrophic for the first part of their lives until they have enough energy to make those first leaves. Because unlike other plants where that energy would be stored inside the seed, they don't have that initial food source. So they have to steal it from a fungus. Then once it's producing sugars on its own, the relationship can become mutualistic and that fungus will be the mycorrhizal fungus associated with that orchid and will receive sugars from that adult orchid.
something you might see a lot if you're driving um, either south of here or east of here. If you're going out to Willow Creek or down to Southern Humboldt, um, you might see oak trees that have these big bushy green parts on them, but they don't have any other leaves. So those big bushy green things are mistletoes. And mistletoes are parasitic plants on other plants. So these ones are leafy mistletoes. They're still photosynthetic and green and they make their own sugars. So they're not stealing sugars from these oaks. The reason why you find them when you go out east or if you go down south is because those are both inland locations in California where it gets very dry. So these plants need access to water. So what they're stealing from the oak tree is not sugars, but water. So they develop these structures within the tissue of the oak tree, penetrate into the xylem, and then they leave their stomata open all the time. So it creates this constant vacuum of water. Um, there's sort of this sink for the water to go to because they're constantly releasing it. So a constant vacuum of water into the leafy mistletoes. So they get a lot of water, but they also waste a lot of water. And because they're not stealing the sugars of the oak trees, often um, it's not gonna kill the tree, but in an intense infection like this, where it has a ton of these, especially in um, long series of drought years together, that might cause the death of a tree. But oaks have really deep roots um, and spend a lot of their early life developing a deep root system because they tend to live in these dry areas. Here you can see the fruits of the mistletoe. Um, the, they're these little berries. Birds like to eat those, and then they'll go perch on another tree and poop, and that's how the seeds get dispersed. A close relative of the leafy mistletoes are the dwarf mistletoes. Dwarf mistletoes are a holoparasite. So leafy mistletoes are a hemiparasite because they only take water. Holoparasites are gonna be taking everything. Their whole survival is based on taking everything from their host. Um, there's many different types of dwarf mistletoes. We have a lot on the conifers in our area. Um, and these will, a sticky seed, so these are ones that have ballistic seed dispersal. Um, they shoot off, they stick to their host plant, they germinate and then punch a hole into the host plant and grow within the host for years before they make any kind of tissues outside. When they do make tissues, they're very small. So this, I think, is on Douglas fir. This is the smallest dwarf mistletoe, and they're smaller than the needles of the Douglas fir. But they'll cause crazy responses in their hosts, like things like this, a fasciculation or a witch's broom, where they cause the plant to make a bunch of uh, branches all close together, because that's sending a bunch of energy to that part of the plant where the mistletoe is located. So you can usually find mistletoes, not by seeing them, but by seeing the symptoms of their infection. In Douglas fir, they'll make these long, weepy brooms. So a normal branch that would be sticking out straight um, will be long and kind of um, draping even onto the ground. And that can increase fire hazard. Here are the fruits. There are these little um, swollen berries that, um, or they might be a droop actually, I don't know, uh, but they swell up and um, kind of act like a lens for sunlight and heat up, and then they'll shoot off this cap um, and shoot their seed. And it has all this sticky fluid around it called vicin that allows it to stick to its host. So these are strictly parasitic um, and big time parasites. These can cause the death of trees if the infection is too heavy, especially for young trees. Another example of a strictly parasitic relationship is the relationship between cordyceps fungi and their relatives and insects. There are many different species of cordyceps and ophiocordyceps, things that are um, going to be attacking different species of insects. And usually they're going to specialize on a particular species or group. So here, I think this is maybe cordyceps militaris. I don't remember where I found this picture, but it looks kind of like it. Um, attacking potentially a grasshopper. And here we have Ophiocordyceps, I believe, attacking an ant. So both of these insects um, were infected at some point with a spore from the fungus, then penetrated into their bodies and grew within them. This particular 
infection also causes different types of physiological responses, behavioral responses um, to the fungal infection. So thinking about this ant, and maybe you've heard this story before um, because it's become quite popularized now, which is great, um, is that ants who are infected with Ophiocordyceps will start crawling up to a high place somewhere above their colony and then they'll bite onto some foliage so that they get stuck there and then they just wait to die and once they do die the fungus grows out of their body and produces these fruiting structures that you can see here look like little antennae and that's where the spores are produced and those spores will then be released into the air above the ant colony where they can then go infect all of this poor thing's um, relatives. So because this is a long relationship with a, a long history, ants have had to evolve in response to it. So ants have evolved to recognize strange behaviors in their ant brethren that are infected with the fungus, and they'll go pick them up and carry them as far away from the colony as possible and deposit them somewhere else um, so that hopefully that ant won't then threaten their entire colony by climbing up above it. So many of these relationships are um, pretty straightforward mutualisms or parasitisms on the individual level, sometimes less so like in um, uh, the example of lichens. However, on the ecosystem level, it's important to consider the parasites in their sort of ecological roles. Potentially, cordyceps fungi have evolved to be population control on different groups of insects, not allowing one group of insects to dominate um, and use all the resources and allow for greater biodiversity of insects in general, because they're keeping any large population from getting too large. And that is an important role that diseases have um, in our global ecology. So thinking about these ecosystem level interactions, when we think about mutualisms, parasitisms, and any kind of symbiosis, which brings us to the wood wide web. So there's a mutualistic relationship between most plants and fungi that you have already learned about from the very first day of our class. The plants photosynthesize to make their own food and fungi do not. So fungi need to find a food source to eat. What they do is, at least these mycorrhizal fungi, will invade plant roots. And in that invasion, they are able to steal sugars from the plant. Sometimes up to 30% of the plant's carbon um, production, their, their sugar and starch production is going to be allocated to that fungus. And it's not like the plant decides, okay, this is how much I can give to this fungus. This is just how their relationship has evolved over time to be this exchange but it's not necessarily voluntary on either side. Both are sort of producing compounds to keep the other one in check. In return, plants can get access to nutrients and water that they would not normally have. Sometimes this is up to 80% of their phosphorus and a quarter of their nitrogen. So we had a question on a lab practical about this, about um, why this evidence of mycorrhizal relationships in early plants would be so important. What we need to think about in that was that there was no soil, there was just rock. There was rock and some slime of microbes on that rock, and that was all those early plants would have had to work with for nutrient acquisition. So they had to develop relationships with cyanobacteria so that they could get nitrogen from that nitrogen fixation. They had to develop relationships with fungi so they could have something out there producing exudates that would break down that rocky material and be able to absorb it at a greater capacity than they could with their dinky little rhizoids. Fungal hyphae have a much smaller diameter than plant roots or even root hairs. So when we're thinking about nutrient absorption and trying to maximize our surface area, fungal hyphae are our best option for how to do that as plants. Because of this, those hyphae can get into smaller pores and have a huge amount of surface area to absorb nutrients and water. So I think I use the example of like when you have really big fingers and you're trying to get something out of a jar and you can't do it. If you can get some, like a tiny pair of forceps and reach in there and grab it, that's sort of what the fungal hyphae are like because soil is full, at least most soil that's healthy, is full of pockets and pores of a variety of sizes where water is going to be sequestered. Here we can see an example of those differences. So we've zoomed in on some plant roots here in this blue box. When we zoom in on that, 
we have the plant roots that are in black here, and they're surrounded by this highly branched, very fine structures um, that are in more of the blue color. And so those are our fungal hyphae. And see how much more of that substrate they're able to access than those plant roots. Here we see an example of two groups of seedlings. The two, or the three, sorry, on the left um, had no mycorrhizal treatment and the ones on the right did. And so these would be the same age. We can see that in the ones that did have mycorrhizae, they develop a um, much more robust root system and have more leaves to work with. So they overall have more tissues and are able to photosynthesize and access more water and nutrients in the soil. So where does the web part come in? Why is this a wood wide web? We have one plant connecting to one fungus. So that's not necessarily a network. That's just two things communicating with each other. However, this fungus can also be connected to another plant, which can be connected to another fungus, which could be connected to another plant, and so on and so forth. So we would have multiple fungi that are connected to multiple plants. And these could be different species of fungi and different species of plants that are all physically connected to each other in continuous tunnels. In a given ecosystem, an individual mycorrhizal fungus could connect to several plants. This is a stem map from a relatively old study now um, done by Suzanne Simard. Uh, each of these kind of little green fluffs represents a tree and the lines represent connections through a mycorrhizal fungus between different trees. So you can see that some of these trees have a lot of connections and some only have a few, right? So if we're thinking about the ecology of this forest and considering maybe which trees we're gonna harvest um, or which trees we need to protect or where we're gonna thin, we might think that this is a tree that we should probably keep around because it is connected to almost all of the other trees in this environment and probably a lot of them are seedlings. We have multiple fungi that are then connected to multiple plants and those can all be different species. This creates an interconnected network. So all of the trees in this stem map besides maybe this one are connected to the same network. Each of these trees, we could draw a continuous line and show how they're connected to each other. So through these mycorrhizal networks, plants and fungi can preferentially distribute nutrients and water. So let's say you have a big overstory tree that is photosynthesizing, getting tons of sugars, um, and then you have little trees underneath it. These trees are suppressed. They can't get sunlight because they're in this big shadow created by this large overstory tree. However, they are connected through their mycorrhizal network to this large tree. So this tree would be considered a hub tree connected to many of the other trees in this forest. And it's also gonna be connected to other overstory trees and midstory trees. And this whole network will be connected. So these trees can say, this one is too close to me, too much competition. I'm not going to send nutrients that way. And how this specifically works, I don't know exactly, um, but there, there is this preferential distribution. So seedlings that are too close or too far away are not going to get nutrients from this tree. Only ones that are in this sort of Goldilocks zone are going to get the most nutrients. So there's this preferential distribution and that might have something to do with survivability or relatedness of these seedlings to that hub tree. And all of that decision making is sort of going through the mycorrhizal network. If you go to HSU and you take mycology, hopefully you'll get to study under Terry Hinkle. He has been doing some work in tropical forests where there would normally be potentially hundreds of species of tree per hectare, 
maybe it's even thousands. It's a huge number. Um, I think I think it's something like 200 different species of trees in a single hectare of forest, which is not very big. And he's looking at forests where they are dominated by a single tree type. So a single type of tree is taking up at least 50% of the space or is at least 50% of the individuals that you would find in that area, which in a tropical forest is so weird. And those trees are all mycorrhizal trees and they're ectomycorrhizal. So they are associated with um, the fungi that go around the outside of the roots and make those um, large fruiting bodies usually. One of his reasons why he thinks they might be able to dominate in that way is because when these big trees die, they're gonna leave a light gap and anything underneath is gonna be able to shoot up quickly to fill that light gap. And what he was finding is that they had a lot of seedling recruitment underneath and around them. And even though those seedlings weren't getting any light or weren't getting enough light to kind of grow, they were still receiving enough nutrients to maintain their size and to stay alive for years. So maybe five, six years goes by, those same trees are the same size, just little seedlings waiting, not growing, just waiting. And then once this big tree dies, these ones that are all the same species can then shoot up and try to fill up that space. And then they'll have to compete with each other, but they are still going to be the dominant competitor um, by numbers in that place because they were fed by their parent tree. So there's also the ability to transmit warning chemicals. So let's say an insect comes and munches over here. This tree starts producing um, immune system compounds, so like salicylic acid, things that will help um, the tree respond to um, an herbivory or to an infection. But that takes time to make its way around the plant body. And there could already be insects munching over here, right? So we are producing this immune response and then it gets sent through the mycorrhizal networks and then triggers the other trees in the network to also produce immune compounds. So their immune systems get turned on even though they're not being affected and that allows them to be prepared for if another type of insect tries to bite on them, they're gonna be ready and they're already gonna be producing those compounds that either make them toxic to eat or um, in some way are deterring herbivory. And through all of this, they can also alter community structure, mostly by that preferential distribution of nutrients and deciding which trees go where. And of course, there's always cheaters. So here we have some parasitism examples in the Wood Wide Web. These are going to be plants that have lost their ability to photosynthesize um, and are generally using a um, mycorrhizal fungus that's connected to a plant that is photosynthesizing and just stealing nutrients from that network. So some examples, um, Cryptothallus mirabilis. This is a parasitic liverwort. Um, I don't think it's in, I think somebody found it in Costa Rica, but otherwise it's been found in Europe and Greenland. However, you might see things like Monotropa uniflora or other monotropoids, um, things that are generally like a pinkish or white color um, that are in the Ericaceae family, which is the same as um, huckleberries or madrone um, or manzanita. So these are things that are attached to these mycorrhizal networks that are attached to the trees. So they're sort of indirectly getting their food source from those trees. And we talked about this in our first lab. So here's some examples of those. We have snow plant, Sarcode sanguine, um, I think maybe this is monotropa, and then this is maybe bush, boschniakia, the ground cone. Um, they're all flowering plants that have lost their ability to produce chlorophyll, so instead of photosynthesizing, they're just stealing those nutrients from mycorrhizal fungi that are connected to photosynthesizing plants. And down here is our weird um, subterranean uh, parasitic liverwort. <laughs> 